Good morning and pleasant Sabbath to everyone. We, the members of the St. Thomas District of Seventh-day Adventists, welcome you to our Sabbath mornings program. Indeed, it's a wonderful privilege that the Lord has given to us. He has brought us safely through this week amidst all the trials and temptations that have come our way, amidst the happy times and the sad times, our victories and our defeats. We can say thank you, precious Jesus, for the way that you have led us. This morning as we come, we come to give God thanks. Thanks for being merciful and gracious unto us. Thanks for being a God who forgives our sins and who cleanses us from all our righteousness. We give him thanks for being a God who directs and protects us. We give him thanks for being a God who blesses one who keeps his promises. So this morning as we come from the north, the south, the east, the west, and in case of our district, from the center, we come to give God thanks and to give him praise. We welcome those from Bel Air, from Jackman's, from Welshman Hall, Welcome all those who are worshiping with us in Barbados, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in North America, in the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, wherever you are in the world today worshiping with us, we give God thanks for you. And we know that you will be truly blessed, not so much so because of the program that we have planned, but because God will be in the midst to hear our prayers, to accept our praises, and to bless his people. Let us all reverently bow our heads as we approach God's almighty throne. Loving Lord, loving Father, our Father, we say thank you for guiding us through this week. We say thank you, Lord, for bringing us safely into this Sabbath morning as we come to give you thanks and praise for your love and mercy extended to us. Lord, as we come in your presence, please draw near to us. Forgive us of sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, so that as we bring our prayers, our praises, and our thanksgiving, they may not be an abomination unto us, but that you may receive them gladly. Cleanse us and make us right to come before you. As a matter of fact, Lord, even as we come, we come at your invitation because you've told us in your word that we can boldly come to your throne of grace. And because of that wonderful invitation, Lord, we now come and we ask that you will accept us. So bless us, bless all that we bring. And my prayer, Lord, is that all that is done today in this service may be done to uplift and honor your name and to edify your people of Yax in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, music plays an integral part in any worship. And the word of God tells us that the angels in heaven, when they go around God's throne, they sing wonderful songs. We're also told by the pen of inspiration that there's going to come a time when the redeemed of God people there will sing a song and the angels will have to fold their wings. And so now as we continue to prepare for that time, we're going to invite Brother Sean Husbands to lead us in our session of music and song worship. Brother Sean. Good morning. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to everybody. I want to thank Brother Sean for the introduction. And yes, indeed, music is going to be a part of life when we do get to heaven. So because of this, we're going to turn to our hymnals, hymn number 245 in the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal. Uh, we're going to sing this song together, more about Jesus. This song is a wonderful song. It has four verses written by Eliza Hewitt and composed by John Swinney. We're going to sing this song together, more about Jesus. I 
I invite you wherever you are in this world to join and sing in this wonderful song. Let's all go together now. More. More about Jesus I would know. More of his grace to other show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Well, more, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More. More of his love who died. More about Jesus, verse two all together. Let's go now more. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be. Showing the things of Christ to me. I say more, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus and more of his saving fullness. See, more of his love who died. Look at verse two together. More, more about Jesus in holy communion, all in communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line. Making each faithful say in mind, I say more, more about Jesus, and more, more about Jesus. Well, more of his saving fullness, see, more of his love who died for me. Verse 4, all together, everybody. More about Jesus on his throne, riches in the glory, all his own. More of his kingdom, sure increase. More of his coming, friends of peace. More, more about Jesus, and more, more about Jesus. Well, more of his saving fullness, see. More of his love who died for me. Amen. Amen. This song was written all the way back in 1887. I, I wasn't born. <laughs> it was written a long time ago. And I would want to assume that this song had tremendous meaning to persons a very long time ago. And guess what? Today in 2020, the song still continues to have meaning for the present day, seventh day Adventist Christians and all Christians around the world. A beautiful song indeed. We're going to turn a few pages over to hymn number 251. The song says, I serve a risen Savior. <laughs> He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. So we're going to sing this song together. He lives. And this is indeed another beautiful song. Alfred Ackley wrote this song. And he also composed this song, composed the music. He was indeed a musician. Hymn number 251. Let's all go together now. Let's all sing together. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the, the world today. Come on, sing. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, well, he's always there. And I know that he lives. 
Christ Jesus lives today. Well, he was with me and tossed with me along life narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You watch me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Let's go first, put together. Now let's go in all. In all the world around me, I see his love and care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair, for I see that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The end of his appearing oh, will come at last, and I know he lives, well, he lives. Oh, come on, I think I can hear you saying from now. He was with me and tossed with me along rolling. Yeah, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he he lives within my heart. Come on, let's bring it home now. Verse 2, let's all say now. Well, rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Well, eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ, the King. Well, the hope. Of all who seek him and the help of all who cry. None other is so loving, well, so good and so kind. Well, he lives, come on, let's sing. Well, he lives, oh, Christ Jesus lives today. How he do it? No. He was with me and tossed with me along life's narrow way. Yeah, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You watch me how I know he lives, he lives. Within my heart. The Christian, in my mind, have the advantage because we can call upon Jesus who lives and he lives within our hearts. So it gives us the edge. When others are hopeless and do not know what to do, we can close our eyes and reminisce on the fact that Jesus lives in our heart. We're gonna turn then to another beautiful hymn. First of all, we wanna thank Alfred Ackley for this wonderful song that he has given us over the years. 308 is our third song, 308. This is another song written by a favorite hymn author, F.E. Blendon. He was also indeed another musician and he wrote, penned the song, I would be this savior, holy thine, teach me how. And we're going to do this wonderful song, holy thine. <laughs> you can snap your fingers, it is okay, you can clap, this is the Sabbath day. So enjoy the message in the song. Let's all sing this beautiful song together. Let's all go. Verse one. I, I would be there if your holy thine. Teach me how, teach me how. I would, oh Lord, not mine, 
Help me, help me now. Let's all sing. Well, holy thy, well, holy thy, well, holy thy, well, holy thy this is my fault. Holy thy, holy thy, holy thy, oh Lord God. Verse 2, all the ladies only. Ladies only, verse 2. Ladies? Come on, ladies. Come on, ladies. Everyone will join together now, holy. Holy thy, holy thy, holy like this is my fault. Holy thy, holy thy, holy thy, oh Lord, just now all the men only in verse three, verse men only, as I cast her fans in the door. Come on, men, I can't hear you. Come down here, come down here, in thy presence, call in all I find, tis my comfort. Everyone will sing together now. Holy thy, holy thy, holy thy, this is my fault. Well, holy thy, holy thy, holy thy, oh Lord, just now. Thank you for joining us in our beautiful sound service this morning. Brother Sean? Thank you, um, Brother Husbands, for leading us and inspiring us as we lifted our voices and indeed our hearts to the throne of God as we give thanks in song. We're going to continue this morning's uh, worship session and we're going to invite Elder Nicholas Bedford as he comes and brings us our children's time for worship. Elder Nicholas. Hi, good morning, boys and girls. Good morning to all of the children across Barbados that are listening across the Caribbean, mind you. I'm so happy to have you this morning. We're gonna have a wonderful time. We're gonna do some singing. I know Elder Sean would have done some wonderful singing just now, but those songs he sang were, were mainly for the adults. We're going to sing some songs that are going to get you in gear and get you in action, get your minds in focus as we get ready to praise God and give him worship. Parents, I want you to get your children on, get your boys and your girls, get them close. As we begin to sing, we're going to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We're going to sing some lovely songs. We've got I got the joy, 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 dong in my heart. I've got the um, God to know to build an art, and I'm going to play these songs for you. And as they play, I want you to sing along. Now, my singing is, is I'm working on it still. So as I sing with you, we are going to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So before going doing anything more, I want you to sing along with us as you follow along on your screen and you sing to God's name honor and glory. Let's all sing together these round of courses. Uh, let's go.
all your sisters, call your friends, tell them we're on and it's our time to sing as we get ready for this next song. Come and sing along with me. Everybody sing and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Yeah, yeah. 
the king of the universe, the jungle, and the sea. Who is the king of the jungle? I tell you, J-E-S-U-S. -S. He is the king of me. He is the king of the universe, the jungle, and the... That's right, kids. Don't forget it. God is the king of the universe. He's the king of the jungle. He's the king of the sea. And most of all, he wants to be the king of our lives and our homes too. Don't you forget it. Now, this week we would have studied our lesson. We would have studied our lesson study. We would have read the story. I don't know who could remember the memory verse, but as we go through this morning's lesson study, I want you to do your best. See how you can remember. Again, call your friends, call your brother, call your sister. Make sure mommy's there. If you can't read, you let them read for you. But if you can read, you follow along in your lesson study books if you've got them as yet. This morning, we're going to go first to our memory verse, not just our memory verse, but our Bible story. It's the kindergarten story we're going to be looking at first this morning, and it's entitled Hannah's Special Baby. Hannah's Special Baby. Have a listen. Hello, boys and girls. This is Aunt Fernita, and I have a wonderful story for you called Hannah's Special Baby. Today's memory verse is from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 17. It says, May God grant you what you have asked of him. Oh, what does it say? May God grant you what you have asked of him. Have you ever asked God for anything? That if it's according to his will, may God grant it to you. Let's have a listen. The message for today's story is we serve God when we help others. Right, we serve God have you ever felt help. really sad about something? So sad that you cried? That's how Hannah felt. It's time to get ready for our trip to the tabernacle to Shiloh, Elkanah said to his wife Hannah one morning. It's almost time for the feast. Hannah smiled. I'll pack everything we'll need, she said. Each year, Hannah and Elkanah traveled to Shiloh to worship at the tabernacle there. But every time they went to Shiloh, Hannah felt a bit sad. She thought back to the early days of her marriage. Many years had gone by and Hannah had not had any babies. Oh, how she and Elkanah would love to have a baby of their own. Finally, Elkanah and Hannah began their journey toward Shiloh. The road was very crowded with other families and it seemed as if every family had children. Wow. Oh, how Hannah wished she had a child. At Shiloh, they worshiped in the tabernacle. When it was time for the special feast meal, Elkanah gave Hannah an extra serving. He wanted to make up for the child that she did not have. Hannah closed her eyes tightly, but the tears still leaked out. Hannah, Elkanah said. Don't be sad because you have no children. Isn't having me better than 10 sons? He teased. After the meal, Hannah slipped away to the tabernacle. Oh Lord, she prayed. If you gave me a son, I would give him back to you. He would serve you all of his life. Eli, an old priest, watched Hannah closely. She hugged herself tightly and rocked back and forth. Her lips moved, but no sound came out. The old priest was sure she had been drinking wine. What are you doing coming in here drunk? He demanded. Hannah was shocked. I'm not drunk, she exclaimed. I was just pouring out my problem to the Lord. Eli's frown disappeared. In that case, cheer up, he smiled. God has heard your prayer. May the God of Israel give you what you have asked for. Hannah suddenly felt her great cloud of sadness disappear. Oh, thank you. Thank you, she said to Eli. Hannah walked slowly back to Elkanah. She just knew God was going to answer her prayer for a son. Hannah couldn't wait to tell Elkanah about her visit with the old priest. Eli had given her hope. Aunt Fernita would like to say hi to four of her very special friends in the United States. 
A very special hello to Asia, Alisa, Anika, and Jaden. Wow, Hannah had her prayer answered. And it's so wonderful to know sometimes we're not sure if God is going to answer, but our job is to pray, put it before God, and let him be responsible for answering our prayers. Hannah prayed to God, and God answered her prayer. Children, boys, girls, at the end of today's study, I'm going to do a special prayer for you. I'm going to pray not just for you, but especially for those who have a special exam coming up next week. Yes, they have to write this special exam. It's called 11 plus or the common entrance. And, but that's a special exam that you'll write when you get to the end of class four. And for those of you in class one and infants A and infants B, your time is coming. You may or may not get an opportunity to write this test. But for those that will be writing next week, I will be praying especially for you at the end of today's Sabbath school. That was for the kindergartens. Now I have something special for the little ones. A lot of the time we forget those little ones, those beginners. They are important too. And I have a special presentation for you guys, beginners. Mommy, daddy, make sure they're there, make sure they're listening. And I hope they're able to follow along and enjoy this one as we share together. Let's see how it goes. The volume on this one may be a little low, so you have to turn your volume up. Hello, Bible friends. This is Anso, and today I have a wonderful story for you called Samuel Listens to God. Our memory verse is from 1 Samuel 3, 1, and it says, Little Samuel was helping the Lord. Look. This is little Samuel. Little Samuel lives at God's tent. Little Samuel has work to do. He is Priscilla's helper. Samuel was God's little helper. He was a good helper, very good helper. Samuel was God's little helper, keeping God's tent clean. See little Samuel? Look at his broom. Little Samuel has a job to do. He sweeps around God's tent. Little Samuel is Priscilla's helper. Little Samuel is God's helper too. Samuel was God's little helper. He was a good helper. Very good helper, Samuel was God's little helper, sweeping at God's tent. See the pretty candlestick. Little Samuel has a job to do. He polishes the candlestick. Little Samuel is Priscilla's helper. Little Samuel is God's helper too. Samuel was God's little helper, he was a good helper, very good helper. Samuel was God's little helper, polishing the candlestick. It is night at God's tent. Priscilla sleeps in his bed. Samuel snuggles in his bed. Samuel is not asleep. He is looking at the curtains. Samuel was God's little helper, he was a good helper, very good helper. Samuel was God's little helper, but now it's time to sleep. Shh, Eli is sleeping. Samuel. Samuel, shh, who's calling? Samuel, it must be a lie. Little Samuel runs to a lie. Here I am, he says. You called me? 
No, I didn't call you. Run back to your bed. Samuel was very obedient, so he ran back to his bed. Samuel. Samuel, who's that? Again? Now it must be Priest Eli. So little Samuel runs back to Eli. You called me Priest Eli, and here I am. No, Samuel, I did not call you. Go back to your bed and go to sleep. Tomorrow we have a lot of work to do. So Samuel went back to his bed. And then, listen, Samuel, Samuel, is it Priest Eli? Let me go check. So Samuel goes back to Priest Eli's room. Priest Eli, here I am. Did you call me? <laughs> go back to your bed, little Samuel. And when you hear the voice calling you again, you just say, Speak, Lord. Your helper is listening. So Samuel goes back to his bed. He's anxious. He wants to hear God's voice. Samuel. Samuel. God calls again. Samuel sits up and says, Speak, Lord. Your helper is listening. And God gave special messages to his little helper. Samuel was God's little helper, and you can be God's helper too. I can be God's little helper, yes, a good helper, very good helper. I can be God's little helper, just like Samuel. Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for giving me the chance to serve you. I want to be a good helper in your house, just like little Samuel. In Jesus' name, amen. Always remember, God wants you to be his little helper. All you have to do is listen to his voice and obey. Boys and girls, that story was just to let you know that you can be God's little helper. It's very important. So we're going to come to the end, we're going to do a very special prayer for you know. All of you that are writing the 11 plus exam, I want you to bow your head with me. I want you to get close to me. If you have anybody else in the family that's written, you can come close, let us pray, and we are going to lift you up before God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being a God that listens to our prayers. Father, there are some special boys and girls who have a special exam coming up next week. One they were planning for, they were preparing for. I pray, Jesus, that you would help them to be relaxed and calm so that they can do their absolute best in the little days that they have with God. Father, I ask that you would help them that is good to, to, to remember to prepare. Father, Lord, allow them to know that you love them. You love them so much, whether they get 100 or whether they get 20. You love them and their parents love them too. Father, I ask you to bless the mummies and daddies. Because sometimes they, they get more anxious than the children. Father, bless them. Allow them to stay calm and relaxed and focused and to know that you care for them as well. Give these boys and give these girls good success, even as they write the exam. And may you be glorified and may your name be praised. In Jesus' name with thanksgiving, amen. All right, boys and girls, I wish you a wonderful Sabbath and I look forward to seeing you next week as I turn you back over to Elder Sean Lynch. Elder Lynch, over to you. Thank you, Nicholas. And I'm sure that the children were blessed by that uh, ministry. I indeed have been blessed. And I'm sure that the children have been blessed. Elder Nicholas, thank you again for your ministry. We're following on from Elder Nicholas will be Brother Pierre Curtin from the Bellier Church. He will be conducting our youth lesson.
However, before Brother Pierre comes, we're going to invite Brother Sean to lead us in song number 15, My Maker and My King. This is a very important song because we live in a time where people do not focus on God as their maker. We live in a time of evolution, but I'm glad that we can say with boldness and assurance and faith and confidence that God is my maker and my king. Brother Sean Husbands. Good morning again. Let's turn in our hymnals to this wonderful song. Like Brother Sean just said, this is indeed a beautiful song indeed. So we're going to sing this song together. My maker and my king. <laughs> Let's all sing this song together, then everybody. My, my maker and my king, to thee my all I own. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring bends all blessings flow. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring bends all my blessings. Verse two all together, the creature, the creature of thy hand, on me alone I live. My God, thy many face demand for prayer that I can give. My God, thy many face demand for prayers that I can give Lord what Lord what can I in and all is thy before thy love demands a thankful heart forgive plus no more thy love demands a thankful heart forgive Oh, let thy grace, oh, let thy grace inspire my soul with strength divine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Amen. Amen indeed. We welcome Brother Pierre as he lays out in our youth lesson. Brother Pierre. Uh, hi, good morning. Okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Pierre. Um, I'll be doing the lesson this morning. Try my best to do it. So let's begin. First, we'll begin with a word of prayer. There, there, Heavenly Father, I want to just thank you for giving us life. Thank you for bringing us again. And let's have a we could all meet as one. Hope you are good to choose that to study that we will learn something or we will help each other to find something new that we could take forward for the rest of the week. For Christ's sake, amen. Okay. Um, the lesson is captured tomorrow morning and this is from the Cornerstone. Um, this is not a question per se, but that's my note there. And my thought is, how much storm warnings do we need? We have been through many hurricane seasons and still every year. Um, we are issues, storm warnings, and storm warnings, and storm warnings. Um, going into the lesson, the key text reads, is from Jeremiah 36, verse 3, and it reads, 
perhaps when the people of perhaps when the people of perhaps perhaps when the people of Judah heard about every disaster and plan to flit on them, they are each better for their wicked ways, then I will forgive their wickedness and their sins. The flashlight reads. Men, men's heart are softened and sustained by the constraining influence of the Holy Spirit. They will give heed to counsel. They will give heed to counsel, but when they turn from admission, upon until their hearts become hardened, the Lord permits them to be led by other influences, refusing the truth. They are set falsehood which becomes a snare to their own destruction. That is taken from Prophets and Kings, page 425. Um, what do you think? This is a question to not only the youth, but hopefully to anybody that feels free to answer. It says, what do you think? When somebody gives you a warning or tells me bad things are going to happen, if you don't change my behavior, I, and these are the questions and you will tell me your responses, I thank them for the warning and give them chances right away. I ignore them or I later think about it and give me and make changes. Um, so anybody willing to give it a try, um, uh, answer? Um, it says, when somebody gives me a warning or tells me something bad is going to happen, if I don't change my behavior, then this is the three, out of these three, these answers, or if you have your own, you can share. I thank them for the warning and make the changes right away. Ignore them. or later think about it and make the changes. Brother Pierre, if I, if I may add, I would choose A, thank them for the warning, and also take heed. Thank them for the warning and take heed. Um, thanks, thanks, Justin. Good morning. If it were me, I would choose C, I would think about it, and then make the changes later. Thanks, Sabia. Um, and my one part would be, once the person is credited, I would um, <laughs> then make necessary changes. Um, Brother Pierre? Yes, please. Um, 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 for me, sometimes, I, I, I will look to... Depends on who it is that's giving it to me. Sometimes I don't uh, receive it as, as, as well as someone else that I really don't see as a close friend or something like that. So then I kind of struggle with it, see if it makes sense, and then I'll move from there. Okay. Um going into the going into the lesson of itself, it reads in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Joseph, king of Judah, the this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take the scroll and write it, write out it all the words that are spoken to you concerning Israel. Um, Judah and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the region of Josiah till now. I said perhaps the people of Judah will hear every disaster I plan to flit upon them, and they will each turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive them of their sins. Um, so 
It also goes on to say that Jeremiah called a scribe and he did, he, and as Jeremiah dictated the words that were spoken by God, he, the scribe had wrote them down. He presented them to the people as they entered. And it was also said that Jeremiah was restricted, so he could not go himself to deliver the message. Um, Along in the story, the king, after the after the message was read to the people entering, word got back to the king Jehoiada, and he brought this. No, the king. No, the king said Jehoiada get the scroll. Um, and then as the scribe was reading it to the king. After four columns or so, the king was burning the scroll one after the next. And basically, that was the story in a nutshell. Um, in reading the story, though, what stood out to me was, or what I asked myself was, because um, if you want to read the Bible verse of itself, after the scroll was read to the people entering the word got back to the king but before that um let's say all the other officials had got wind of the message before and some of those people um when they heard the message they kind of feared it they got a little frightened um and then well they went to uh, I think his name was, I forget the call right, Bora. That was the name of his scribe. Uh, after they heard from it, they told him and jo uh, Jeremiah to go ahead. When I heard that, I was wondering why after the Lord instructed me, I would therefore put myself in Jeremiah's shoes, after the Lord using me to warn his people about what he would do and I don't think it's a bad warning because it's a warning for forgiveness. Like, if one of this listen to me a little and change one of ways that I will forgive one of and we can start to know why they were hard to go into hiding. Whether why they will have to go into hiding. Um, but as you read the Bible text of itself, he was later used again by God to send another message to the king, which I understood why he had to go into hiding at that point in order for him to be used again. Um, I want to go to Monday section and it asks you these, these few questions. But before that, I want to read Luke 13.9. It says, it bears, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. And Manda says, read this week key text. Make this statement below two hours on what to read in the next text. Um, so true or false? God was planning to punish the people of Judah for their sins. So true or false to the <laughs> congregational class? God was planning to punish the people of Judah for their sins. And while you're thinking about that, the other two are forces, God had in his mind already, God had made it his mind and nothing was going to change that. Um, Uncle Pierre, can I call you <laughs> Uncle Pierre? <laughs> um, just so that everyone could be engaged, can we use the yes and no in the participation section to say true or false? Yes being true and no being false. Would sure, you accept that? Yes, no problem. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, Brother Pierre, I am. Um, I I I want to say I'm not sure if I am a yes or if I'm a no. Could I be uh in between? 
I'm following on from what you would have said with the if about the tree. Um, when God gives warnings, it's just a yes or no. If you do, if you don't do, or do he? Uh, or does God give us a, a, a chance, an opportunity to to change from our ways? So can I be not a yes or not a no? Um, to which question would that be to from the made his mind not for the children or he was planning to punish Judah for their sins? Yes, that first one. Okay. Um, I don't know if it could be a yes or no. I think the first one is just true that God was planning to punish the people of their sins. Go, yes, he was planning to. But 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 that does but the promise didn't come with a condition. If they would have changed their ways, then he would not have punished them. So then that would be your answer for the second question. Yes, please. I will go for it. Yes, yeah, I agree. His, 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 God, had made it his man enough he was going to change it that which that question would be false because if they had listened to the message then god will have not have polished them okay go okay okay um and the same things that I had read, when I read it, I had liked it a lot. It's not saying to cut me down or cut off people right away. Um, I mean, it's saying if you don't bear fruit. So if you don't do what is required of you as a fruit or as a person or as a Christian, then, then obviously you will have to be some I have to face some sort of consequence of not doing what is asked of you. Um, it says, think of some other... All right, all right, let's go and read this. Many of the... Many of the predictions and warnings of the prophets brought to God's people were conditional. If they continue in their wicked ways, the destruction will come. But if they were willing to change, the outcome would be different. Most of the worries we face are conditional too. Their, their work computer programs called if then statements. If you do this, then this will happen. If you watch this to TV show instead of studying, then you will fail your exam. But if you change your ways and study, then you'll pass. In Acts, think of some other if there's warnings that you can relate to in everyday life. So everyday life is not necessarily, but don't have to be Bible stuff. It does have to be like, if you drive on the wrong side of the road, what will happen? Then you will get an accident. So can some people name some if they statements? If you don't wear your seatbelt and put this cat show, you'll be fine. This one readily comes to mind. If we don't wear our mask, <laughs> <laughs> we are really exposed to COVID. <laughs> yes, that's one. If I don't read my Bible and pray every day, I'll be a weak Christian. Mm -hmm. And all of these things, if the uh, if the last supper first will be a positive for it, just in case. So if he when he does read his Bible every day, he'll be a strong Christian. And for Sister Aslan's case, if you read if you wear a mask, then you will most likely not catch COVID. Um, so going away from the lesson a little bit, 
Um, I just want to ask or point out the point that in warning people, um, you have to be kind of you kind of know you have to know what you're talking about, or have to like a person that's doing landscaping. If they come and tell me that if I put down this block, this way I build my house. It's not that I would not, I wouldn't really necessarily believe or take heed because in my mind, he may not be know what he's talking about. So in everyday life, even outside of the story, when people or when we as Christians go to warn people about um, Christianity or life or the Jesus or what he have done for us, we cannot go on not knowing what we are saying. And the only way we could know this is if we, for ourselves, study the Bible or what works best. In most cases, some people, if we clear our experience, if your person experiences, to, to get your story put across better. And in closing and wrapping up, um, the, the flashlight suggested for the, this week uh, suggests that the more we often we ignore God's word and refuse to repay, the harder it will be for us to change. Check out the quote by John Biner in the other I set in the other I section in the same idea with different words. God, get in the habit of listening to God, read your Bible, pray, and pay attention to the advice of other friends, teachers, spirits, leaders. If we get used to responding to God's guidance, then it will be easier to follow. So it's saying, in closing and wrapping up, once we um follow God once we listen to God once we put our faith and trust in God it will be easier for us to listen to other people because we will be actually we will know I know for lack of better words we will know who to trust because also our trust is in the Lord we will believe that he will put the right people before us and the right persons to give us advice so thank you for listening and thank you for participating and continue to have a good summer. Thank you, Brother Curtin. I'm sure that we all enjoyed that study. After Jesus was crucified and was risen, he had a meal with his disciples by the beach. And he asked Peter this question. Lovest thou me more than these? Lovest thou me more than these? Lovest thou me more than these? Jesus asked Peter that question three times. And Peter answered in affirmative three times. And this was after he had denied Jesus three times. Our next song, number 248, Oh, how I love Jesus. My prayer is that we all answer as Peter did. Lord, thou knowest I love thee. Brother Sean. Thank you, Brother Sean. Hymn number 248, Oh, how I love Jesus. Join in your voices with this beautiful hymn together. Let's all sing. Let's all go together. There is. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. That's why, oh, how I love Jesus, and oh, 
how I love Jesus, I know how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells me about the Savior's love, verse 2. It tells me of the Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfectly. That's why, oh, how I love Jesus, and oh, how I love Jesus, and oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Verse 3 tells of one. Let's go. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in his sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. That's why, oh, how oh, I love Jesus. And oh, how oh, I love Jesus. And oh, how oh, I love Jesus. Jesus, because he first loved me. Amen. Amen. Elders Cullimore and Ali, they are the ones who will be guiding us in our adult lesson study this morning. Over to you, my brothers, Elders Ali and Elder Cullimore. Happy Sabbath, everybody. And uh, yes, Sabbath. we are. We're about to take a look at our adult lesson study. This is lesson number two. And if you've been following the themes, the theme of the quarter, you know it's all about witnessing. But more than that, it's about making friends, making friends for God. And when we make friends for God, then we have a joy of sharing in God's mission. And that's what we're focusing on. I don't know how much time we will be spared. We initially have 20 minutes, but we will see how far we can get. We want yeah, to welcome those of you. Have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. You heard it there yourself. So if you have a comment or a question, you have to make it very succinct. And so others can respond to it and we can move forward. I want to welcome Brother Dublin all the way from UK. One of my friends is joined in. So if you hear a British accent, that will be his. Let us pray. Father, we invite your presence now. We invite your wisdom to be in this session, that we may understand your will for us and that we may do your will. For Christ's sake, amen. Yes, Brother Justin, how are Sir, you doing today? I am well, and you? Good, I'm good. We are here talking about witnessing and witnessing not just how we may think about it as Adventists, but there's a new spin to it. There is the personal testimony. So Justin and I, we're gonna back and forth. We're gonna um, talk about witnessing. And then if you have a question, make sure that you put your hand up in the chat, not in the video, but in the chat. We will try to acknowledge it as soon as possible. The title then, the, the topic then this week is winsome witnesses. A friend of mine had to research the word winsome. It's not a very common word. I had to. And you had to, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds positive. It has the word win in it, which sounds good. Winsome witnesses. So what is winsome? And then we have to define what is a personal testimony. Then I can mm -hmm. have a question for you or maybe our, our, our audience. What does winsome mean? And then what is a personal testimony? Do you know? Yeah, they said attractive or appealing in appearance or character. So when we talk about mm. a winsome witness and also the word handsome is also derived from from Winsome. So that Sounds is good. why it is entitled or captioned Winsome Witnessing because we want an attractive um, case or, or a story about some uh -huh. personal experience. So that is why it is captioned Winsome Witnessing. So it means our, our personality must be attractive. It must be appealing. It must, you must feel like if that person, you know, is someone you can approach, uh, someone that you can feel comfortable with and what is we, we have this notion of a personal testimony did you define it what is a personal testimony and a follow-up question is what qualify what qualifications 
do you need to have a personal testimony? Which school? I know Justin has been to many schools. So can you tell me which Great school? Well. <laughs> which school is necessary to learn how to have a personal testimony? So what is a personal testimony, and how many schools? Which school can you can you apply to to learn how to have a personal testimony? <laughs> sure, and it, it's prominent. It is it is something that you have encountered. So once mm -hmm. you're telling you're you're telling persons about something that is personal, it's something that you, the individual, has encountered. So yeah. when we talk about now, this caption is about having a connection, a relationship with someone. And that someone, cool, that all of us, not just because you've gone to primary school or secondary school or tertiary institution, we are all in the school of Christ, every single person. So once we have accepted Christ, we are in that school and we have that personal connection, that personal testimony of which we can speak. All right. So let's take a look at our memory text. It's not so much a memory text these days as just a text because a lot of people don't commit these things to memory. But this one is taken from Acts 4, verse 20. And it says, for we cannot but speak. It says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now I heard a friend say, to have somebody speak all the things that they see and hear is not always good, especially when children talk about your business. They, they speak and say stuff that you don't necessarily want them to say at the wrong time. You know, there's sometimes people, when you're watching a movie or a picture, they tell you what's going to happen next, and you're very upset that they're spoiling it because they're telling you all that they've heard and seen in that movie before. So in some cases it might feel negative, but why is it such a positive thing here? Why is it for the Christian important to speak the things that we have seen and the things that we've heard? And we're going to be looking at that this week. And so let's move on to some of the stories that address that exact thing. And we have a few case studies this week where we see persons who were using their personal testimony. My personal favorite is uh, Paul in front of King Agrippa, maybe because he shares my name, and uh, maybe because of the circumstance. Okay, so let's take a look at Mark five, uh, chapter five, and we're gonna be looking at 15 to 20, and we are introduced to our first case study. Here we see Jesus, he is in a city called Decapolis, I believe, and he has recently, in some at some recent point, he has he has chased the demons, a whole legion, which is a set of demons inside of a man. And here we meet this man sitting down, and they say he's sitting, he has on clothes, so he's no longer naked, and he appears to be in his right mind. And then the verse fifteen ends with a funny. A funny sentence. And they, the people of the capitalists, were afraid. That's very strange. I mean, why would they be afraid? So in reviewing this story, Justin, do you see anything here that is unusual? Anything in this story that's interesting? So we have a previously de demon-possessed man sitting normally, but the people were afraid. The people did not want Jesus to be in this city. And then Another interesting part where the man says, let me join you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no. I mean, why would Jesus say no? What, what part of this story or what points in this story seem unusual? What's interesting to you? Okay. Um, following on for what you have said, the capitalist, uh, city will, well, they capture it, the capitalist, te Deca or Deca, um, for 10, and Polis, will, will, which will mean with the city, so uh, you, we have to start there. Ten cities in this part of this part of the world near the Sea of Galilee. So when we have this caption, we have to put it into perspective this way. So mm -hmm. this particular gentleman, known throughout the capitalists, so he's yes. known throughout the cities as a man that had demon. He's a demon possessed man, a trouble man. So he had mental issues. He had physical issues. So he had a whole set of issues. So then he met Jesus. Not mm -hmm. only did he meet Jesus, but Jesus delivered him physically, emotionally, psychology, um, psychologically, and mm -hmm. spiritually. 
So Jesus made him whole. So then when he said to Jesus, but you know when you met you you meet someone and they would have done something great for you. You want to, yes. you know, you want to be with them, you want to be their sure. friend, you want to, you know, look, you're you you are now, I am now one with you. So he said to Jesus, Let me, let me, you know, let me join you, let me be a disciple. And Jesus said, remarkably, you know, remarkably. you don't need to join me. You can yes. go and tell the other persons in these cities what I have done for you. And that yes. is something that that is maybe the unusualness of the story because yes. Jesus told him, listen, instead of coming with me, you can do greater work in the city. So Jesus delivered him for this reason. And so he can spread the God, the good news of salvation or what Jesus can do for you. Because yes. sometimes we come to Jesus and we, we don't understand how Jesus can make us whole. And in this story, Jesus made this man whole so that other persons can understand the personal connection or the personal benefits that we can derive from serving Jesus. Absolutely. So in my, in my opinion, too, and I'm agreeing with you, here is a miracle that was wrought in this city. And the people of the city don't want the miracle worker. Mm. So in other words, Jesus's ministry would not have been effective. Mm -hmm. They viewed and valued Jesus as disrupting their economy. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, is, Jesus realized his ministry could not possibly work here. He could not evangelize in this city, but he used another mm -hmm. strategy, which would have been the personal testimony of this previously de demon-possessed man. And, I mean, it, it was perfect because here is a man who all of them knew was demon-possessed, and they could not deny the fact that he is now acting quite normal. So I want to yes, jump in here quickly, based on the point you're making. I, lo I love that. Um, it, it says also, we want to put it to our time as well. We are, we, we, we are in a church area. Uh, we are going to do field work. Yes. And you know that some of our members may come from a particular area. Let's say we, we, we are in Allen View, or maybe a ski road, or maybe a market hill, right? And and yes. you know we, we are from those areas, and we are already saying who to send. So yes. you know it is good that we can send a person who the per, who persons are familiar with, and who oh, have yes. a good reputation, and then know you know something. This was an individual who used yes. to do X or oh, Y yes. or Z. Oh yes, absolutely. But because we can send them now, persons can receive them better. So instead oh, yes. of me going to Market Hill, I am not known in Market Hill, but I'm known in Allen View. They can yes. send me in, uh, I'm, I'm in, in Allen View. They can then, send um, Sister Curtin in Market Hill. They can send they knew, uh, Bedford in Jack And they knew that you used to be mm -hmm. a scoundrel. <laughs> They knew, yes, they knew uh, that you used to be a no-gooder, <laughs> a difficult challenge fellow, a rebel. True. And now true, you are reformed. True, true. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank God for that. If there are any questions or comments, here is a good time. We're at the halfway mark. So we're going to wrap up in another 10 minutes. So if you have a question or comment, please indicate now. You have to speak it quickly, your question quickly, or make your comment quickly. If there's no one, we're going to move forward. So you have to be able to move quickly with that question. All right. So I've seen none. So let's jump to the part that I think because we're soon going to run out of time. So let's jump to this is just a review. We're not studying every single day. But I, I like the story with Paul and King Agrippa, which we find in Acts 26. So if you've read it, you would know that Paul was at that point. Um, doing missionary work. He was all through that city and the surrounding cities and areas. And he has been, a, he's now a prisoner. Is that a comment coming in? And I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead with the question, please. I'm not hearing that question, so we're gonna have to move forward. There's some feedback coming. Yeah. All right, so let's move forward, forward. So in Acts 26, we meet Paul. He is a prisoner, and he's before a king who may not be able to decide his final fate, but certainly can influence his final his final fate. And can you tell us some of some of what is happening here in the story before I can give some my, some of my own personal comments? What's sure. happening here in the story? Bring sure. us up to speed. Um, 
Yeah, so so Paul, a missionary, Paul, a, a person who who encountered Jesus. So let me start by the fact that Paul, let me even go even go beyond that. So Paul, a Jew, the alert man, yes. was, you know, he really wanted to be a devout Jew. And he chased all the Christians. At the time, the Jews didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't accept that this poor individual yes. is the son of God. And they don't want to accept that. So Paul, you know, grew up an alert man in the Jewish setting, understood all of the customs, read well, and studied well. But he, you know, he was so filled with rage against the Jews that he wanted to kill out the Jews and stop this this movement. Yes. So then on the on the road to Damascus, Jesus met with Paul. And what an experience. What an experience yes. he had. And it, you know, you know the story how he was blind and, and then he received his sight after he was he, yes. he met the apostle there and so on. So then Paul now is a man, a changed man, a, a, a man now preaching about Jesus, yes. whom he was um was against. So now Paul met Jesus. Now he's preaching when all the, all of the cities in Asia Minor, and he's doing a lot of work spreading and teaching about Jesus. So now he is now captured. Now Paul is a Paul is also a Roman citizen, and that is also key. He's a Roman citizen, but he's appearing before a Jewish king. Now this king, Agrippa, does yes. not like godly things. That, that is amazing. A, God, a king does not like godly things, but that is something else. But then yes, Paul is given is. his personal testimony in front of all of these individuals. And he's one, he was respectful. So Paul is, is there in front of the king. He's saying king, and he's very respectful. And he's laying out his case from the beginning of all his experience. He said, you know me. You know yes. the Jewish customs and all these things. But now I am a changed man. I have been with Jesus. And now am I... Am I doing mm -hmm. something wrong? And he appealed to King Agrippa's conscience. And so his conscience was quick because he yes. told Paul, Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. You almost persuaded me to be a Christian. So Paul's te personal testimony, Paul didn't do anything with, with um, topics or anything that, you know, any of the, the, the 28 beliefs or anything that Paul was just simply yes. saying, look, I have met Jesus, and Jesus has changed my life. He can yes. do the same for you. And King Agrippa was almost persuaded. So Paul, I just yes. laid it out for you in a quick minute, so you there can you take go. it from here. So what's remarkable is the fact that if you had to defend your position, your life, you would look for the best lawyers. Mm -hmm. You would make the best legal arguments that you possibly could. But it shows the strength of a personal testimony because in order to convince King Agrippa, he didn't use any legal points. He didn't use any lawyer tactics. He didn't use any law books and, and anything like that. Instead, he used a personal testimony. Now, Alan White says that, yes, a Bible study is great and sound and can be used, but there's nothing that can replace a personal testimony uh, we see that here. And the personal testimony was so convincing because these people knew Paul. <laughs> they knew about Paul. And the fact that Paul was who he was before his transformation, and now this is who Paul is today, was enough evidence <laughs> that anybody could, trans could be transformed. I mean, there's one thing to say, yes, you can be transformed. But when you are interacting with someone who has been transformed and you knew that person that like you were saying your own personal view, you knew who, who that person was and what that person was before. And now you can see who they are now. There's no greater witness than a personal testimony. So we may not have a big personal testimony like some of these characters here like Paul and, and these others, but even our, our, let's call them small, our small stories of conversion can be a witness to, to many others. Okay, uh, I'll call quickly before yes. we, you know, you know, we time is going very quickly. It's about three um, minutes There's a question left. here. I want, there are two things I want to say. About, I want to talk about testifying. That is something yes. that's very important here. And also, there's a question that posed from Elder Nicholas. He said, why was it that after healing people that persons were told not to say anything about what we have heard or what we have seen. 
Why is that the case? That's a challenging question. I can't be in the mind of Jesus, but I think there was some aspect of it was personal security and safety. There were, there were people out there trying to destroy Jesus and may even try to destroy the persons who took the message. Mm -hmm. As you know, Jesus, sometimes there was a time Jesus had to disappear out of a crowd. There were times when Jesus had to move out of a city. Paul experienced the same thing. He had to move out of cities where people could have become violent. So I suspect that when people spread the news that the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were enraged even more and started to plot the demise of Jesus and his ministry. They were very unhappy. In fact, we had that story this week too. Where, where was it? This is when the, the leaders were not happy with uh, what they were seeing. This is the boldness of Peter and John. They mm -hmm. saw that Peter and John, Peter was a fisherman. And John and his, uh, the sons of thunder, they, James and John, they were sons of thunder. Sons of thunder is a fancy way to say they were men that were angry and hot-headed. They got vexed mm -hmm. real fast. Mm -hmm. They would kill people just from anger. Now, the, the leaders saw that these same men, this fisherman that swore and cursed and got on like a, a rebel, and these hot-headed men were transformed. And what were they fearful of? They were fearful that this, this new transformed life that people could witness and see, because they, they themselves, they met secretly and said, we can't even deny that these men are now different. They, they saw this transformation as a threat because it would start to influence other people around them. So I think in a similar way, when um, Jesus told them not to spread immediately, not to share these things because he knew or foresaw that people would become, the leaders would become enraged and want to respond and may, may shorten the, the effect of that particular transformation. That would be my Brother, response. Can you here now? Yes. Brother Paul, yes. your we answer have is... No more minutes, but go ahead. Your answer <laughs> ahead, is correct me. and it is supported by scripture because mm -hmm. you could remember Jesus said that his hour has now come and he said, Father, glorify yes. me. Yes. So your, your answer is correct and is supported by scripture. Amen. Well, we have little time. Um, no time, I should say. <laughs> so Justin. Brother Paul and Brother Justin. Yes, yes please. Two minutes to wrap two up. Two minutes. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Right, so I may wrap it up. Yes, let's now. do some wrap up thoughts. and then right. we'll So my wrap it up will deal with pretty much the when we are in church. And that is why we need to testify of the goodness of God. There are oh, yes. persons who will not be drawn because of doctrine. Yes. They'll be drawn because of what we have, the experience we have with Christ. They want that experience. So if yes. Christ can heal me from cancer, from diabetes, from any illness, and we testify about, the, about that, or, or that there was a situation in my family, how there was a rift, and Jesus came in and solved that. And we can, a person can now see, look, we are together, and we share that in church on Wednesday nights so oh, on yes. Sabbath, and we can testify about the goodness of God. That, yes, that, and that's why the Bible said God is love, you know. Yes, and, and people are drawn to that. So I want our brothers and sisters to know in my wrap up. Yes, let us testify of the goodness of Jesus Christ, and that's where, that's that's where it's about. That's what it's about. Not yes. about all the doctrine. Doctrines are good, mind you. Doctrines are good. But yes. it, the basis of what is about is the love of Jesus Christ and his transforming power. That's my closing and, argument. And I will, I will add to that, that the testimony, although it says personal testimony, it's really God's testimony. Let me explain Amen. that. Mm -hmm. Ella White says when we are talking about our sinful past, we shouldn't glorify it. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing a testimony, it shouldn't be about ourselves. It must be about God who does the forgiving and God who has done the healing and God's loving Amen. kindness and God that has given us good things. So we mustn't glorify self when we're doing personal testimony. We must always point back to Jesus because when we go to others, Amen. that's who they must see. They mustn't see us. They mustn't see us in our situation. They must see that God has changed us and transformed us. So we thank you everybody for joining us and for participating. Those of you who have and listening and 
this is where we are going to close and we pray that you will continue to study this quarter is a very interesting quarter about witnessing and if you've not uh you you may have your preconceived ideas about witnessing but this quarter we're now going to look at various perspectives and how we can improve our witness and 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 thus please god who is calling us to be witnesses let's pray father we give you thanks we thank you for your word and your message. We thank you for the examples in the Bible that we can glean from how we should operate as well. Give us then a joy that we may we may witness for you and in thus reach those of us in our circles, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, and reach those through our personal testimony so that they may find in you a relief and a shelter as a personal savior as well. Continue to bless the remainder of this day for Christ's sake, amen. Have a blessed Sabbath, everybody. Thank you, elders. I'm sure that you're enjoying our program. And you've been sitting for a while. So we're going to give you five minutes to stand and to walk around, to stretch, to have that cool, refreshing glass of water or juice. And we're going to invite you back in five minutes as we continue this morning's worship session. In the meantime, we invite you to listen to some uplifting Christian music as we take a five minute break. Thank you.
Welcome back. I trust that you have been refreshed. Within the last five minutes, you were able to get all that you needed to get. I know we are ready to resume our morning's worship. We invite our pastor, Pastor Bernard Prescott, to give us our announcements and updates. Thank you, Elder Sean. Let me say pleasant Sabbath to everyone. I want to let you know that God is still in control in spite of all the challenges that we may be going through. And now for the announcements. The Assembly of Endless Advent Schools will be conducting a virtual open day on July the 20th, 2020. We invite all of you to come and find out some of the questions that you are, get some of the questions that you have answered. Now, this virtual conference will be through Zoom, well Zoom, Zoom, and we will send the link to you so that you can be a part of it. Sunday evening service continues tomorrow at, set, at six o'clock. That is Sunday evening service continues tomorrow at six o'clock. Wednesday evening service at 7.30. Thursday evening session at 7.30. The administration of the East Caribbean Conference of Southern Adventists have given the all clear for the churches, that is the church buildings, to be reopened on the 18th. However, for the churches to be reopened, they must meet the government requirements, that is the protocols of the government, and also the requirement of the East Caribbean Conference of Southern Adventists. On Wednesday night, I invite you to listen so that we can update you as to how far the churches in the St. Thomas District are in meeting these requirements. Deacons and Deaconesses service will be held tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And the Zoom link, you can contact your elders or you can contact me and I will pass on the link. I would like to meet with all elders this evening at 6.30. Elders, special meeting for you this evening at 6.30. I also want to let you know that there will be a special memorial service for Dr. Camberton Viggins. And that memorial service will be held this evening at 4 p.m. You can join the broadcast on the conference, that is the East Caribbean Conference YouTube channel. This evening, we will also be having youth meeting. So we want to invite you to join us. Well, you may have to, some of you may have to make a decision as to where you will go, but I'm sure that you will want to be a part of the young people meeting. These are all the announcements for now. And I pray that you will continue to serve God with all of your heart, knowing that he will come very soon. Thank you, Pastor. As we prepare to go into our divine service, I just want to let you be aware that once the divine service begins, our program will continue unannounced. 
that again, once our divine service begins, the program will continue unannounced. Call to worship. This morning, our call to worship comes from Psalm 68. Psalm 68, I'll be reading verses one to four from the New International Version. Psalm 68, verses one to four from the New International Version. It reads thus, may God arise, may his enemies be scattered and his foes flee before him. As smoke is blown away by the wind, may you blow them away. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing praise to his name, and extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord, and rejoice before him. The wicked flee from before the presence of the Lord, but the righteous rejoice at his coming. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. I take this opportunity to welcome you to the Divine Hour Service of the St. Thomas District of Seventh-day Adventist Churches. We are happy that you have chosen to worship with us today. An extra welcome goes out to our visiting friends at home and abroad, also to our Regular members, we welcome you. All praise, honor, and glory belong to God. May God bless us as we continue to worship together. Let us continue now with our hymn of adoration number 34. Our hymn of adoration number 34. With the song of joy and gladness, the song says, Hither bring your noblest place. Let's all sing this song together. Let's all go with. Wake the song of joy and gladness, hither bring your noblest bliss. Who oh, banish every thought of sadness, for in forth your highest praise. Well, sing to him whose care has brought us, oh, once again with friends to me, oh, and with love in the voice has taught us oh of the way to Jesus be well wake the song oh wake the song and the song of joy and gladness wake the song oh wake the song the song of jubilee joyfully with songs and banners everybody Joyfully with songs and banners, we will greet the festal day. We we'll shout aloud for glad Hosanna and a grateful homage pay. Well, we will chant the Savior's glory for oh, while of us we raise up all tell is still. Old, old story, precious, redeeming love. Well, wake the song, oh, wake the song, and the song of joy and gladness. Wake the song, 
make the song the song of jubilee thanks to the holy father thanks to the holy father for the mercies of the year oh may each heart and spirit be gather swell with gratitude sincere thanks to the O loving savior oh for redemption through thy blood oh breathe upon us holy spirit Sweetly join us near to God. Well, wake the song, oh, wake the song, the song of joy and gladness. Wake the song, yes, wake the song, yeah, the song of Jubilee. Amen. This morning, our scripture reading is taken from 1 Kings chapter 20, reading from verse 22 to verse 13. 1 Kings chapter 20, reading from verse 22 to verse 13. Reading. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. And the servant of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plains, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing. Take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put the captains in their rooms. And number thee an army, like the army thou hast lost, horses for horses, and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice, and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Belhada numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valley. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day, the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew the Syrians and hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and there a wall fell upon 20 and 7,000 of the men that were left. And ben Haddon fled and came into the city, into an inner chamber. Here ends the scripture reading. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Father in God, this morning, we give you praise and thanks for all the wonderful blessings you have poured upon us. We thank you for Jesus, our best friend, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for Daniel in our stead that we can have eternal life. We thank you for your Sabbath day, a day of joy and gladness. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us and all that you have given to us. In a very special way, Lord, we ask that you come to the bless each and every one of us bowing in thy presence. We pray for your Holy Spirit to touch hearts and to touch lives. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with each and every one of us in such a way that when this service is over, we'll be drawn even closer to you. Meet our needs according to your riches and glory. Provide for those who lack. For those who are sick, Lord, 
We pray that you will heal and recover. For those who are discouraged, Lord, I pray you'll be the great comforter and stand by our side. Give us the assurance that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Bless even the little ones that they too can enjoy the service. We also ask you, Lord, to be with those who are doing the CSC examination. Pray that all the things that they have learned that you'll bring back to memory so that these children can be successful in all the endeavors and they can have the assurance that you are by their side and you're interested in their well beings all aspects of their lives, including their education. So may they be successful. May you continue to bless them as they study and may they have the assurance that you not only hear praise, but you are also in the business of answering prayers. Bless our pastor. You have used him before numerous times. Lord, I can, I can sense that something special will happen today. And so we ask for your Holy Spirit guidance. We ask that your Holy Spirit will touch his brain cells, that you will touch his lips, and that you will also touch the technology so that those on YouTube will see and hear and be converted. So that those on Zoom will see and hear and be transformed. Have your own way, Lord. Let your will be done. Bless this entire service, for we ask these mercies in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Let the whole church now say, Amen and Amen. We have come to that part of the service where everyone can participate. It is offering time. And I'm sure that you have placed aside that special offering. You have placed aside your contribution towards the work of God. And at this time, I'm going to invite you to offer a silent prayer in your heart as you give to God and to his work. I want to invite you to view this video, very short video at this time. Did you know that every return of tithes and offerings systematically for the rest of our lives, out of duty, or because the church says to do it, then we're giving for the wrong reason? Did you know that if we serve in several offices and positions every year, for the rest of our lives out of duty or because we want to receive compliments from others or we like the adoration that comes with that position then we're given of our talents and abilities for the wrong reason did you know that if we attend church every service for the rest of our lives out of duty or because we want to be known as good christians then we're given of our time for the wrong reason did you know that if we don't give faithfully of our financial resources, if we don't give faithfully of our talents and abilities, if we don't give faithfully of our time, then we're making a wrong decision. Giving. Giving contributes to growth. Growth in the physical church, growth in membership. Growth in the financial resources of the church, growth in the spirituality of the church. However, if this giving does not come out of a heart of love and gratitude and appreciation for God and what he has done for us, then we are not giving as God wants us to give. Why? Because giving for any other reason than for love is working for salvation. And honestly, all that giving makes no difference to our salvation. So, when we give our tithes and offerings today, give it from a heart of love. Because giving from our love has no limits. We give what is needed to accomplish God's goals. When we give of our talents and abilities and time, give it from a heart of love. Because giving from a heart of love has no limits. We give what is needed to accomplish God's goals. And I hope Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, your heart of love. So let him give. Not gradually or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Father, we ask a special blessing upon these tithes and offerings that will be given into your service. 
May they go to further your cause and grow your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you for giving to God's work. We now move to our children's corner. And our children's corner this morning focuses on an emotion that plagues each of us, anger. And the way God has made our bodies is that one part of our bodies uh, impacts on another and therefore when we begin to feel angry that emotion can be felt physically so let us focus on this morning's children's corner to see how by god's help we can manage our anger when you take it your way, just remember to say Everything will be okay, everything will be okay I'm Howard B. Wigglebottom I want to be the Ninja Bunny Ah I have to take a time out all day Everybody has been saying I do the wrong things when I get angry. Well, that makes me mad. And sad, too. Howard had time to think about his day because he wasn't allowed to go outside and play. He remembered being really happy at the beginning of the day. Lunch was spaghetti and meatballs. To top it off, it was chocolate milk Wednesday. He couldn't wait. His stomach was making funny noises. Howard wasn't thinking about schoolwork because he kept looking at the clock, waiting for lunchtime. Finally, the bell rang and everyone lined up to go to the lunchroom. Howard was so excited, he cut right to the front of the line. His friends complained. Hey, he cut. Did you cut in line? Please go to the end. Howard did not get his way. He kept his eyes on the chocolate milk. There wasn't enough, and Oinky reached for the last one. Howard knew what he had to do. That's my chocolate milk! He tried to kick the milk out of Oinky's hands the ninja way. He went flying through the air. So did Oinky, the spaghetti, meatballs, and the last carton of chocolate milk. Howard did not get his way. What a mess you made, Howard! Clean that up at once! While everyone else was eating Howard's favorite lunch, he was mopping up the floor. He was hungry and very grumpy when Oinky walked by and said, Hey, you missed a spot! Howard got a strange feeling in his tummy. His heart started pounding really fast and his hands made a tight fist. Then he saw red. Howard B. Wigglebottom, Ninja Bunny Wannabe, totally lost his cool. He jumped towards Oinky, but missed and fell right into the mess. Howard did not get his way. That's it, Howard B. Wigglebottom. I'm taking you to the principal. After school, thinking about his day made Howard very sad. His mom interrupted his thoughts. Howard, your friend Allie is here. I'm sorry you can't come out and play. Me too. How come you don't have timeouts? Don't you ever get angry? Well, I do, just like everyone else. When I don't get my way, my tummy feels all tight. Before I do the wrong thing, I say, Stop! It's okay to back away. Then I go out and do something to feel good again. Will you show me how? Sure! 
When I really listen to my tummy, it lets me know if I'm scared, hungry, or angry. If it's tight, I'm pretty sure I'm angry. Every day after school, Allie helped Howard listen to his tummy, back away, and do things to feel good. When you can't get your way, just remember Jumping. Say, everything will be okay, everything will be Yelling ninja three times. Back away, back ninja, away, ninja, back away, ninja! It's okay. Counting fingers and toes. Back away, back away. Wait, mm, I feel a little bad. My tummy throwing a ball. And knows when I'm mad. I said, wait, no, no, it's a no go. I start to back kicking a ball. Me heel slow. Yeah. Uh, After a few cold. weeks of practice, Howard hardly ever lost his cool. He learned that when he doesn't get his way, he says, "Stop. That's okay." He listens to his tummy, backs away, and then goes out to play. Back away, back away, back away, it's okay. Back away, back away, back away. I trust that we would learn from that story. And I give God thanks that he has made us in such a way that our emotions can be felt in our physical bodies. And therefore, through the help of his Holy Spirit, we can have an understanding of, of when we are getting close to the edge. And we can ask him to help us. Let us all remember our heads as we ask God to help us so that we can deal with anger and other um, challenges that face us. Let's remember our heads. Father, we give you thanks that you have made our bodies to work as, as one unit. And therefore, when something affects us emotionally, we can have an impact physically as well. And this is good because it helps us to learn more about our bodies and help us understand that we can come to you who have made us, who have promised to give us the strength that we need to overcome our weaknesses. So this morning, Lord, we lay them all at your feet and we claim victory through Jesus Christ and his power in us to transform us and help us overcome evil. In his precious name we pray. Amen. To bring the message of salvation to us today is none other than our pastor, Pastor Bernard Prescott. However, just preceding the pastor's message, we are going to have another song in ministry from Sister Jamal. Immediately following this song will be Pastor Prescott.
let me say a special thank you to Sister Jimmet for that special item of music. I want to let you know that we in the St. Thomas District are very happy to have you with us this morning. For those who participated in the service so far, I want to thank you for your work. Let me say thank you to Sister Sandra Evelyn, who would have done our welcome and opening hymn. Our scripture reading was given by Sister Bedford. Our prayer was done by Elder David Walks. Our host for today is Elder Sean Lynch. And the one who will give the benediction is Elder Quinton Allen. For a few minutes this morning, I want to share with you a special message from God's Word. And I have entitled it, God of the Mountains. I invite you now to bow your heads with me as we pray. My gracious God, we are so thankful this morning that we can come in your presence to worship you in the beauty of holiness. And every time we come in your presence, we recognize that you are working a miracle on our behalf. For we know that sin cannot dwell in the presence of a holy God. But in this morning we come shouting, we come praising you because Jesus Christ has died for us and he has made that connection that, that when we come in your presence, God doesn't see us, but he sees Jesus. We pray now that you will speak to us, open our hearts, that we may, that we may receive your word gladly. And Lord, we pray at the end of this message that you will receive the honor, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. God of the valleys. God of the mountains. The valleys in the Bible connotes the dark experiences of God's people. In Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones depicted God's people carried away into Babylonian captivity. In Psalm 23, the phrase, the valley of the shadow of death, is a reference to the dark experiences through which God's people must travel at times. In Psalm 84, the valley of Baca, known as the Weeping Valley, was a gloomy way through which the pilgrims had to travel on their way to the temple in Jerusalem. Valley frequent our experience. We are either about to go into a valley, going through a valley, or coming out of a valley. Generally, we do not like valley experiences. We refer to our valley experiences as bad times, and our mountaintop experiences as good times. We have been led to believe the flawed concept that God is God of our good times, but he is not God of our bad times. Today, I've come to let you know that God is as much God in the valley as he is God on the mountain. The same God that is working for us on the mountaintop 
It's the same God that will be working for us when we are going through the valley experiences. And there's a story in the Bible that beautifully demonstrates this. And it's found in the book of First Kings. Go with me to the book of First Kings, chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Are you there with me? Well, follow me now. It reads, And when the prophet came to the king of Israel and said to him, Go, strengthen yourself, take note, and see what you shall do. For in the spring of the year, the king of Assyria will come up against you. Then the servant of the king of Assyria said to him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But if we fight against them in the plain, surely we will be stronger than they. Let us understand what is happening here. Ben Hadad, the king of Assyria, and his army were defeated by the Israelites' army in the hills before. And this was not a war to prove how courageous and mighty the Israelites were. It was a battle between the gods of the Syrians and Jehovah God. And this was a battle to prove once again that Jehovah God was the only true and living God. After the Syrian king Behadad and his army was soundly whipped by the small insignificant army of Israel on the hills surrounding Samaria, Ben Hadad calls a meeting of his advisors to find out how such a weak Israelite army could defeat the mighty Syrian army. The offers of the king of Assyria attributed the victory to divine aid. They said, their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were able to defeat us. But if we fight them in the valley, we will defeat them. You see, they had a false understanding of Israel's God. Unlike the Israelites, the Syrians had several gods. They had a god of the hills, a god of health, a god of the plain, a god of rain, a god for sunshine, and so forth. Their goals were limited to a specific area. So they thought that Israel God was a localized God with no power over the hills, with only power over the hills and not of the plain. And they reasoned that Israel's foot soldiers would be no match for Ben Haddad chariots and horses on the flat. You see, before Israel had fought the Syrians in the hills, and, and if you know anything about war, the artillery that the Syrians were using could not operate in the hills. The horses and chariots could not operate in the hills. And, and so the footmen of Israel were able to defeat the Syrian army by the power of God. And so the reason that if we fight them on the plane, we will have the advantage this time. 
And because we have the artillery, we have the horses and we have the chariots and the footmen of Israel will be no match. But Israel God, our God, cannot be restricted to any one location. But Psalm 139 verses 7 to 10 states, Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wind, the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. God is omnipotent. That means he is all-powerful. God is omnipresent. He is here, there, and everywhere at the same time. God is omniscient. It says that he knows everything. Because he is all of this, that means that God is in control of the situation in our world. He's in control of your life and my life. And I will explain that a little as we go on. You see, when you are in a valley, it may seem as if God has forsaken you. But God has promised in Isaiah 41 and verse 10, Fear the Lord, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will uphold thee. I will uphold thee with my right hand of my righteousness. And I will continue to read from Isaiah chapter 46 on verse 10. And it says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand. I will do all that I please. This shall bring great hope and comfort and strength for us in time of challenge. Ellen White wrote, and I'm quoting from Patriarchs and Prophet, Prophets and Kings, sorry, pages 49 and 500, pages 449 and 500. And she says, in the annals of history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear as if dependent on the will and force of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, ambition, caprice, but in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside and we behold, listen now, we behold above, beyond, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest and power and passion, the agencies of the all merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. God is behind. God is in control of everything that is happening in this world. And so if you think for a moment that the devil is in charge, you're wrong. God is in control. And he is working out his plan. When we know that God is in control, 
and that he rules in the affairs of this world, we can face any adversity. Because we have that hope and assurance that God will work out his promises in our lives. He will work out his purposes in our lives. In 1 Kings 20 and verse 28, God sent an unnamed prophet to tell King Ahab that victory is assured. And you know by this time, Ahab was afraid. But God assured him, you need not to be afraid for I am in control. I will defeat the Syrians. The prophet told Ahab, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude in your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So it was not by might or power that Ahab was going to defeat this mighty Syrian army. It was by the power of God that Israel would accomplish the task. And God made it abundantly clear that when the Israelites see the work of God on their behalf, defeating the, the Syrian army, they will declare that God is God not only of the valley, not only of the mountains, but he is the God of the valley. What a wonderful decoration for us to meditate upon. Israel God, our God, is as much God of the mountain as he is a God of the valley. Did you get that? You know, we'll be here about time when we, especially when we are going through difficulties, when we are going through the, the, the problem of life, the value of life, we behave as if God cannot help us through. But today, I've come to let you know that when you're going through your valley experiences, God is with you and he will take you through. I also want to let you know that he'll be with you in your mountain experiences. God is God in our good times. He's God of our bad times. He is still God when we are going through pain, and that is physical pain. He's still God when we are going through spiritual discouragement. He's still God when we are going through sorrow. He's still God when we go to the doctor and the doctor says, there's nothing that I can do for you. He's still God when we lose our jobs and the mortgage or the rent is to be paid. He's still God even in these times of COVID, 19 pandemic, when the, the, the leaders have given up, God is still in control. And as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we need to keep this in mind. God is working out his purpose. He's still God at all times. He's God of the day, and he's still God of the night. I just want you to understand that God is bigger than your problems. I've come to let you know today that he's taken closer than a brother at all times. Aren't you glad that God doesn't drop people? Aren't you glad that God picked people up when folks kick them down. Regardless of the valley you are faced to go through, you will find that God is there. 
verse 29. This verse tells us that it was on the seventh day that the battle was joined. And the children of Israel killed 100,000 foot soldiers of the Syrian army in one day. Did you get that? The children of Israel killed 100,000 soldiers of the Syrian army, not in the hills, but in the valley, in the plains. In that area where the Syrians said that, that if we can only meet them in the plain, we will defeat them. If we can only meet them in the plain, we have the advantage because we have the dynamite. We have the artillery. And they thought that they were fighting against the Israelite army, but they did not understand that they were fighting against the God of the universe. What a shocking defeat for Ben Haddad. Imagine losing 100,000 soldiers in one day. But the story gets me to know. For in verse 30, we are told that the remaining folks of the army escaped and they fled to a place called Epic. And while they were in that city, a wall fell down and killed 27,000 soldiers. And on the staff, on the arm, Israelite army defeated the mighty army of Ben Haddad. The defeat was so devastating that Ben Haddad ended up hiding in the city of Apex. Now, we need to ask the question. How did this puny little Israel army defeat the strong and mighty Syrians? How come the battle had such a surprising outcome? <laughs> Somebody said that one with God is a majority. So you can rest assured that you can face any battle with Jesus because victory is guaranteed. Now, again, the word of the Lord to Ahab through the nameless prophet explained what happened. In 1 Kings 20 and verse 28, this is what the prophet said. Because the Syrians think the Lord is a God of the hills and not a God of the valley, I will deliver this vast army into your hands and you will know what, what will you know? You will know that I am the Lord, and you will be able to testify of the goodness of God. It was the Lord who gave Israel the victory. In fact, there was not a thread of evidence that Israel had the strength, the power, the artillery to defend, to defeat the Syrian army. And I love my God. He always allows us to face challenges that we see insurmountable 
so that he can come true for us. Note, at the battle on the hills of Syria, the Syrians declared that Israel God was the God of the mountains. But now after this defeat, the defeat in the, in the valley, they had to admit that Israel God was not only a God of the mountains or a God of the hills, but he was a God of the valley as well. Aren't you glad that our God is Lord over all the earth? Aren't you glad that he is a God over all geography? Not just the hills, but over the plains and the valley. And he is a God not just over Israel, but all the countries that and everything that is with that is upon this planet. He is God over the whole earth. Do you know what that means? That means that he is God over all of our experiences in life. Not just over the experiences of the good times, but he's also the God of our experiences of the bad times. Aren't you glad that God is big enough, is strong enough, wise enough, and loving enough to take care of us anytime and anywhere. We have some folks who only can praise God and give God thanks when things are going good. You know, during the good times, the mountain top experiences. And I'm sure that, that we can come to church at Wednesday nights for a prayer and testimony meeting and we will hear some, for men, some church members declare the goodness of God as they experience the moment of experience. But then the challenge comes. When we are going through the valley experiences, we are a little timid. To, to, to declare that God is good, that he has given us strength to make it thus far through those dark experiences. And because he has given us the strength to make it through that far, he will give us the strength to overcome. We need to praise God under all circumstances, not only the good times, but we need to praise him to join what may seem as the bad times. But thank God, thank God for those church members who will come and, and declare the goodness of God even in the bad times. And I wrote in Council of Stewardship, page 148, it is not the empty cup that we have trouble in carrying, it is a cup full to the brim that must be carefully balanced. Affliction and adversity may cause much inconvenience and may bring great depression, but it is prosperity that is dangerous to our spiritual lives. Unless the human subject is in constant submission to the will of God, unless he is sanctified by the truth and has the faith that works by love and purifies the soul, prosperity will surely arouse the natural inclination to presumption. In the valley of humiliation, 
where men depend upon God to teach and guide their every step, there's always comparative safety. And that is why God allows us to go through valley experiences. You see, in the valley, we learn to trust God. In the valley, we learn to lean on the everlasting arm. In the valley, we learn that God is our burden bearer. In the valley, we learn that God is a deliverer. In the valley, we discover that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Brothers and sisters, life cannot be all sunshine or the flowers will die and the oceans will become dry. Life can't be all blessings for there will be no need to pray. So we need to thank God for the valleys that we are walking through today and bless him when we are on the mountain top also. Wherever you may be today, whether on the mountain top or in the valley, remember, and I say, remember that God is in control. And because you are a child of the King, you can trust God with your life, knowing that your God is able to take you through, whether on the mountain top or in the valley. If for some reason you need further consolidation of this message today, let me share the story with you. Once a man had a dream of his life history, which flashed before him in footprints in the sand. The story goes like this. That this man examined the history of his life and he recognized that during the low experiences in his life, there were one set of footprints in the sand. But during the good times, there were two sets of footprints in the sand. And, and he just couldn't understand why there were just one set of footprints in the sand during his weakest moment, during that time, he was going through the more difficult times in his life. And he looked to Jesus and he asked Jesus, how come when I was going through the difficulties of life, you forsook me that, that there were only one set of footprints in the sand, my footprints. And Jesus looked him in the face and said, my son, my son, you see, during those difficult times in your life, when there were only one set of footprints in the sand, those were my footprints. You see, that was the time I was carrying you in my arms. And brothers and sisters, friends of mine, God has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So whether we are going through the good times on the mountain top, God is with us. Or when we are going through the valley experience, the difficult times, the challenging times, God is with us. And at times, if Jesus has to carry us, he will carry us. I'm thankful today that we serve a God not only of the mountains, but also of the valleys. Let us pray.
our Father who art in heaven. We want to thank you for assuring us that in life we will have mountaintop experiences and we will have valley experiences. And you have assured us that you will be with us at all times. Lord, today somebody may be going through his valley experience. He may be discouraged. And I pray, God, that you will reach down and, and, and just place your loving arms around him and, and assure them that the same way you came through for Israel, in the valley, you will come true for them. Maybe some of us who may be on the mountain top enjoying life, but, but I want to say to you, brothers, brothers and sisters, that after the mountain top experience, the valley experience will come. And mountain top experience do not last for long. You too have the assurance that God will continue to be with you whether you are on the mountaintop or in the valley. Thank you, Lord, today for showing us that we serve a big God who is in control and that one of these days he will come again and take us out of this same cursed earth. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. It's all right to ask, will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong ties lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? I'm so thankful to know that we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock, which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. So will your anchor hold? Yes, your anchor can hold if it is anchored in Jesus. Our closing song as we bring this more, today's service to an end is number 534. Will your anchor hold? Brother Husbands, please lead us in this song. Certainly, Priscilla Owens and William Kirkpatrick teamed up well in writing and composing the music to this wonderful song, 534. Let's all sing together now, Bill. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their winds of strife, when the strong ties lift and the cable strain, will your anchor drift or for remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul. Stand fast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely for will the storm withstand. For it is well secure by the Savior's hand. Bulls pass from his heart to mine, can define the blast. As through strength, 
divine. We have a rancor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the bellows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move. Wrong did firm and deep in the Savior's love. It will firmly hold in the straits of faith. For when the breakers tell that the reef is near, and the tempest rave, and the wild winds blow, not a nine grave shall overflow. We have an anchor that keeps the soul, when steadfast and sure, when the billows roll, or fastened to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love, it will surely fall. It will surely fall in the floods of death. For when the waters cold kill our latest breath, rise in time, it can never fail. While our homes abide within. The bill. We have an anchor that keeps the soul well steadfast and sure while the billows roll, unfastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold, respite. When our eyes behold in the dawning light. O shining gates of pearl, O harbor bright, we shall anchor fast, heavily sure, with the storms all past forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul, well steadfast and sure, while the billows roll, well fastened to the rock, which cannot move. Rounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Good afternoon. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we have come to the close of our service, we would like to thank you for the message and the pastor for so ably presenting your word from on high. Please let it stay in our hearts so that we would here with others, continue to bless each and every one of us, especially those visitors who tuned in. Protect, cover, and guard us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for joining us for today's session. We have come to the end of our worship for the morning and early afternoon. We invite you to Join us this afternoon for our airway service. Indeed, God has been blessing us. And I'm sure that you, each of you will join with me and say that it has been good that we have been in the presence of the Lord. The opportunity is now afforded to each person to send their greetings, their well wishes, their thoughts of love and appreciation as we go into our churchyard to have fellowship one with another. Again, thank you for joining us. And we invite you to join us again at our evening's airway session and then tomorrow night at 6 p.m. God bless and do have a blessed day. <laughs>